Earth has always been an unpredictable place to live. But an increase in extreme weather and other terrestrial phenomena seems to be signaling changes on our planet. As storm chaser George Karunas prepares for another season, he reflects on a memorable and sometimes terrifying year. Hey, don't you wish you were in the Texas Panhandle today? 2005 was one of the most unbelievable weather years on record. Uh, it seems like the planet went wild. And being a storm chaser, it sure kept me busy the whole year. Between volcanoes, tornadoes, and hurricanes, I was busy almost every month of the year. Although he has been at the center of these events for over a decade, Karunas cannot fully explain the worsening trend. Uh, we don't know exactly why the weather has gotten so intense this past year. We suspect that global warming may be part of this, but we don't know exactly whether it is man-made or a naturally occurring cycle. So I'm going out and learning as much as I can about these weather phenomena, these hurricanes and tornadoes, and maybe we'll learn more about what these patterns are like and whether we can expect another year of increased activity like 2005 in the not too distant future. Setup. Yeah, we, we got a nice. George setup. Karunas nice has been water. staring down big uh, storms for over 10 years. Tornado watch box just went up. But he is up for almost yeah. any challenge, even a fiery pit of molten lava. Right. Well, I've been chasing tornadoes and hurricanes for almost 10 years now, and I'm really interested in expanding my horizons and getting into geological uh, phenomenon as well, like volcanoes. And it just so happened that in early 2005, I was able to get aboard a expedition to the remote Erta Ale volcano in the Danakil Depression area of Ethiopia. The Danakil Depression is one of the least hospitable places on Earth. Daytime temperatures soar to 45 degrees Celsius. There is armed conflict everywhere, and there are no roads. But there is a giant mountain of 2,000 degree molten rock. The perfect spot for George. Our goal was to trek through the desert, climb up to the top of this volcano, and then I was gonna descend down inside and film from within the volcano on top of the crusted lava lake. Radio test, one, two, three. The trip itself was a grueling journey. It took us several days of driving across old lava flows, sharp rocks, intense heat, and we even had problems with flooding, believe it or not. It's one of the hottest deserts in the world, and we ended up having to deal with flash flood situations. After two years of drought, a series of heavy rainfalls has made the terrain almost impassable. George and his guides work for hours in the scorching heat to move only a few meters. Adding to this already stressful situation, local skirmishes along the border have made the region even more dangerous. George must travel with armed guards for safety. As you can see, well, there are no roads. As the driving conditions worsen, George and his companions have to make a difficult decision. Because of the flash flooding that we encountered, we actually had to abandon the vehicles at one point and decide to trek across the desert. We started in the pre-dawn morning and then trekked for 25 kilometers across these uh, rough, rough lava flows. And it was really, really difficult in the hottest heat of the day and it took us all day to reach the top of the volcano. We actually got camels to transport our equipment up for us. And at the top of the volcano, it was uh, certainly a relief to see the lava smoldering and smoking away when we finally made it to the top. 
Once at the summit, the group discovers other challenges. The heat is more intense than anticipated, and the volcano emits huge amounts of toxic sulfur dioxide fumes, which blow everywhere as the crew prepares their equipment for the descent. The gas actually combines with the moisture in your lungs to produce hydrosulfuric acid, which burns your eyes, stings your throat, and quite often we'd have to wear a respirator just to be able to walk around and do our work and filming around the volcano. <laughs> As George prepares to descend into the unpredictable lava of the Erta Ali volcano, he discovers that once again, Mother Nature has done the unexpected. Getting down was quite an experience. It was like descending into the bowels of hell. Looks like we made it. It's one of the toughest things I've ever done. Hiking for 25 kilometers in the Danakil Desert. Adventurer George Karunas has made the arduous trek into the remote Erta Ali volcano in Ethiopia. Things aren't going exactly as planned. I actually got quite a bit of a surprise when we reached the, the summit of the volcano in that the lava activity had changed from our previous reports that we'd gotten a couple of months earlier. The level of the lava lake had risen up, a crust had formed on top of the lava lake, and there was these hornitos rising maybe 10 meters out of the center, these cones, and they were smoldering, and you could see the lava in them. And we didn't know how stable this crust was. I didn't know how thick it was. I didn't know how much lava was underneath, how far down the lava was, but we still had a plan to go down and film from the inside. And it was definitely a surprise. We were charting some unknown ground here. No one had walked on this lava before because it was some of the freshest land on Earth. The team spends the whole day rigging the ropes and other safety gear, as well as testing the stability of the lava before George makes the treacherous descent. They push heavy rocks down on the dried lava bed to check for weaknesses. Falling through the crust is something you don't want to do. When the expedition was originally being planned, they weren't planning on descending down into the volcano. I actually had to uh, convince them to let me do this. And because of the instability of the crater walls, we used a special system that is designed for mine shaft rescues, that kind of thing. So even if I ran into trouble down in the bottom, the people up top could haul me up if there was an emergency. George is tethered to the harness, and the last like safety checks are completed. Helmet camera is on. Everything must run smooth, as George's life could be in the hands of his safety gear and his crew. Every detail is checked and rechecked. Can we just get this all set? He is lowered into the crater where 2,000 degree lava flows just below the crust. Good. Good. Hold, stop. Getting down was quite an experience. It was like descending into the bowels of hell. Extremely hot. Uh, once I got down onto the crater floor, I was able to put on my heat suit, set up my tripod and my camera, and then do some exploring around. And I was actually really able to get close to these hornitos where the sulfur dioxide gas was billowing out of. It was like walking on the moon. I can only imagine how Neil Armstrong felt with his suit on, taking his first steps on the moon. And at one point, actually, as I was walking across the crust, my foot broke through, and I actually dropped a few inches. And that was uh, <laughs> disconcerting at best. After that, I had to be very, very careful where, uh, wherever I stepped. He completes the walk safely, adding another remarkable experience to his collection. Getting so close to something that is that dangerous, it was exhilarating, but you have to have a certain amount of respect for that. Uh, this volcano could have at any point just started to erupt. The surface of the lake could have easily sank into the lava. It certainly was 
nice to know that there was a team of people there to help. Because out there in the desert, if something goes wrong, you're pretty much on your own. An incredible adventure. Certainly nothing could top that, except perhaps the wild weather of 2005. George loves big weather. If it blows, rips, drenches, or spins, he's there, camera ready to take it all in. First up every year are tornadoes, and the 2005 season was a storm chaser's dream. When it comes to tornadoes, the peak season is in May and June in the Tornado Alley section of the US, which stretches from Texas through Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and then up into the Dakotas. And every spring, I spend an entire month chasing these tornadoes, and I even bring people along from all over the world. We, they come and join me on a tour group, and we travel like nomads across the plains, just trying to see the worst weather that you can imagine. The tornado highlight for 2005 was definitely near the town of South Plains, Texas. On that day in rural Texas, amazingly, two tornadoes touched down simultaneously. A rare treat for George and his group. But two tornadoes are twice as dangerous. We were actually able to get very, very close to this tornado, and as we approached, it got bigger and darker and more menacing looking. We're gonna be able to get really close to this. Yep. And we eventually were able to get close enough that we could actually hear the tornado. It sounded a bit like a waterfall and it crossed the road directly in front of us as we watched it rope out. I got problems, man. We lost a side window, we got lots of windshield. Go forward, go forward, the go forward, big go problem with this particular tornado was that it had a lot of large hail that was being propelled around the tornado. These hailstones were huge. They were the size of softballs and they were rock hard. It sounded like a gorilla pounding on the roof of the van. The massive hailstorm quickly becomes a dangerous situation for the chasers. George calls on his years of experience to keep his group safe. I had a lot of difficulty trying to maintain control of the vehicle because the windshield was smashed out, there was a lot of glass that was flying in and landing in my lap, visibility was terrible because of the rain, and the windshield wipers were destroyed as well. So trying to keep all of those things in mind while trying to navigate a van around a tornadic storm and keep the people inside safe is a real challenge. Predicting tornadoes and coordinating intercepts is a full-time job in the field. It takes patience, stamina, and luck to get into the action. Here's today's tornado probabilities. We actually have a moderate risk, which is pretty impressive. A typical tornado chase day starts off with making the morning forecast. And that's when you have to try and pinpoint the area where you think the best or worst <laughs> storms are gonna be. And so we'll start targeting and try and get into that position. We'll look at computer models, satellite images, all kinds of different data off the internet to try and figure out where our forecast should put us. The first part of the day is spent collecting data, but it is later in the afternoon when the action heats up. As sunlight warms the open ground, hot air rises to produce the unpredictable weather. The sun heats the ground, the ground heats the air, and then you have these huge thunderstorms that can billow up. And the rotating thunderstorms, which we call supercell storms, are the ones that are more likely to produce tornadoes. And they can be up to 60,000 feet high, which is twice the height of Mount Everest. As these storms mature in the early afternoon, final data collection and analysis is completed and a location is selected. We've got a tornado watch box. Once George decides on a game plan, the chase is on, tracking and approaching the twister from the south to avoid the worst of the winds and hail. The key is to never underestimate the power of these weather systems. Uh, turn around, turn around, turn around. I need to turn it back this way. It is absolute. Turn around, get up, turn around. Tornadoes pack the strongest winds in the world, and the amount of damage that these things can inflict on a town is almost beyond description. Roofs can be ripped off by an F2 tornado. An F3 tornado will destroy an entire house. 
when you get up into the F4 and F5 scale, that'll take an entire house and remove it from its concrete slab. And there's no way that you're safe inside your house, even in an F5 tornado. The safest place would be underground in a storm shelter or a basement. And in an F5, you might not even survive that. Oh! Oh, it just took out a structure or something. Oh my God. Oh, it is huge. George has some advice for anyone unlucky enough to have to face one of these monster tornadoes. If you're ever caught near a tornado, don't try to outrun it. Move at right angles, try and get away from the tornado if possible. Uh, one of the worst things you can do is get up underneath an overpass. Uh, the wind speed actually increases as it goes underneath the, these highway overpasses, so it's actually quite dangerous. And staying in your car is dangerous as well. Your car can be crumpled up like a Coke can and tossed 100, uh, 100 meters easily. If you can't escape, get into a ditch, lie down, and cover your head. That's your best protection. The storm chasers relentlessly pursue their target along its path of destruction for as long as they possibly can, using video and still cameras to capture their encounter. We'll follow the storm into the evening and then probably uh, film lightning as the sun goes down, and then find a place to stay and do it all again the next day. Tornado season was barely over when hurricane season kicked into high gear. It really started with Hurricane Dennis hitting Pensacola in uh, July of 2005. It was the first major hurricane of the year, and I knew I had to be there. Down to the uh, last hour or so before uh, Hurricane Dennis makes his uh, final landfall here in Florida. Tornadoes are powerful, yet very concentrated in size. Their big brothers, hurricanes, can be many thousands of times bigger. And 2005 was one of the cruelest hurricane seasons in recorded history. Dennis, Wilma, Rita. Names that will not soon be forgotten. But one name, given to the storm of storms, will stay with George forever. Katrina was definitely the most intense experience of my life. The most destructive hurricane to ever hit the US and the costliest ever. I didn't know how bad it was gonna be when I started to pursue this storm. But as the days went on, leading up to the storm, traveling down through the central US, getting closer, we heard the reports of the storm getting stronger and stronger. And then the night before it hit, it was a strong category five storm. And they don't get much stronger than that anywhere. The predictions coming from the National Weather Service in New Orleans were ominous. They were talking about mass destruction, uh, the potential for buildings crumbling, the tremendous loss of life. It was hard to believe. And we were worried because we knew that we were going to be on the strong side of the storm in Gulfport, Mississippi. And the night before the storm hit, it was uneasy at best. There was a small group of us in a steel-reinforced concrete parking garage. And we were up all night awaiting the storm, and we knew that it was gonna be bad in the morning. On the morning of August 29th, 2005, one of the most powerful hurricanes in recorded history hits land in the US. Although initially less intense than predicted, it was only the beginning. As the day progressed, conditions deteriorated rapidly, and by midday, the winds were howling unlike I'd ever seen. There were pieces of sheet metal flying around in every direction. Bits of gravel from roofs were slamming into us, breaking car windows, and we couldn't even see across the street. The winds were so strong. We knew that there were possibly people dying around us. Uh, we couldn't tell what was going on. There was no communications and it was an eerie, eerie feeling. Um, even though I'm there to enjoy the storm and to experience it as a storm chaser and to document it and share that footage, it's difficult to be in a situation like that where you know that there's so much destruction going on and there's nothing I can do about it. George, the other chasers, and some media people are holed up in a concrete parking garage in downtown Gulfport. 
With wind speeds topping 150 miles an hour and debris flying everywhere, the only way George can maneuver is to virtually crawl across the floor. The risk of getting hit by a projectile is high, and George is very cautious. It was like standing in a waterfall or being in a blender for 12 hours. It was one of the most uh, incredible things to witness. Hurricanes are unlike tornadoes in that with a tornado, you're on the outside looking in. But with a hurricane, you're tasting it, you're breathing it, you're feeling it, you're smelling it for hours and hours at a time. And it's a complete immersive experience. Immersive is an understatement. Whether from standing in driving rain for hours at a time, or actually standing right in the storm surge, George is nearly always completely wet. Not surprising, considering he is directly in the path of the most powerful part of the storm. Where I was in Hurricane Katrina in the Mississippi Gulf Coast, that's where the worst damage was. The strong side of the storm was on the east side. New Orleans was actually on the weaker side of the storm, and it could have been a lot worse if the storm had tracked a little bit further west. But where we were, the destruction was completely widespread. There were boats that were pushed a half mile inland, cars flipped upside down. George is able to make it out safely, but what he witnesses as he drives north makes him quickly realize the scale of this incredible natural disaster. The scene along the way was just, just block after block after block of complete destruction. It was uh, unbelievable just seeing boats overturned and buildings collapsed. It was uh, unlike anything I'd seen. From the earth, the sky, and the sea, increasingly powerful forces remind us that our planet is in transition. 2005 certainly was my busiest year ever as a storm chaser. With all the hurricanes, tornadoes, and volcanoes, it makes me wonder if these world weather patterns are changing, and maybe this is a harbinger of things to come. <laughs>